All right, today was one of the most important days in Unit 2. The legislative branch of the United States does one thing. It creates policy, it creates legislation, it generates laws. Yesterday we talked about the word bill. A bill is a proposed what? What's a bill? It's a proposed law. It's a piece of paper. No one has to obey it, no one has to enforce it until both houses of Congress passes it and it becomes actual legislation, it becomes an actual law. All bills want to become law someday. This is what we're going to be talking about today, how a bill becomes a law. So, first question is, who can write a bill? Anyone can write a bill. Anyone. You don't have to be a member of Congress. You don't have to be a senator or a House of Representative member to be able to write a bill. In fact, most legislation right now that are being talked about in Congress, they're actually not written by the congressmen themselves. They're written by other people. They're written by people in the White House for the president. They're written by lobbyists from interest groups, but they're not actually written, most of them are not actually written by the members of Congress themselves. Sometimes they're written by people that work with the congressmen. But here's the caveat, here's the trick, the second one. Anyone can write a bill, but bills have to be formally proposed by a member of Congress. Bills have to be formally proposed by a member of Congress. If I was the President of the United States, and I write a legislation that I want, uh, that I want Congress to consider, I can't do that by myself. I cannot introduce or propose a bill to Congress by myself. I'm going to have to get somebody that's my ally in Congress, a congressman or a senator, a House of Representative member or a senator, to introduce it for me. You have to be a member of Congress for your bill to be considered, for the bill to be considered. Only members of Congress can propose a bill. All right, proposed bills look like this. If it's HR, that means this bill was introduced in which house? House of Representatives. House of Representatives. Uh, house of Representative member is the one that introduced this bill to Congress. If it has an S, that means who introduced it? One of the senators, one of the 100 senators in the Senate was the one that introduced it. You can introduce it in either house, except for what type of bills? There's one type of bill that cannot be introduced in both houses. It can only be introduced in one house. Taxes, taxation, revenue bills can only be introduced where? In the House of Representatives. They can only originate from the House. They have to be approved by the Senate later on but they can only come from the House. Only House of Representative members can propose revenue or tax bills. Any questions about that, guys? All right, moving on. committees in each house made up of members of Congress who are supposed to be experts in that particular policy area. So if this bill is about farming, it goes to which committee? Farming. It goes to the Agricultural Committee or the Farming Committee. If this bill is about science, it goes to the Science Committee. The committee members are the ones that get to look at the bill first. They get first dibs on the bill. They get to evaluate the bill and whether or not it's fit to be released to the House floor, to the Senate floor, for all their fellow colleagues to analyze, debate, and vote on. So before a bill even gets to the House floor, or even gets to the Senate floor, it's discussed in committee, it's reviewed in committee. They do something called a markup or a hearing, where they take a look at the bill, they debate the bill, they bring in experts to talk about the bill, whether or not they're for it or against it, and the effects the bill will have in American society, and then the committee will vote. If the, a simple majority of the committee likes the bill, then it gets to move on. That's called a favorable recommendation. The committee likes the bill, they give it a favorable recommendation, a simple majority of the committee members feel that the bill is good enough for their other members of the House of Representatives to take a look at and review. But more often than not, what happens to bills in the committee? Uh, this is where they die. They do not get enough votes that they need for the bill to move on in the process, so they get killed off early on. 
Most of the work of legislation happens in committee. So by the time a bill reaches the House floor, most of the work is already done. The research is already done. They've already talked to the experts. But that, oh, by the way, let's say this bill goes to committee. They talk about it. And then it goes to the House floor. They give it a favor recommendation and it's released to the House floor. And then we debate the bill. The entirety of the House of Representatives or the Senate debates the bill. If I have a question about the bill, who's probably the best people to ask? The committee, the committee members. The people in that committee. This is their baby. They let it be released. They've already talked about it. They already talked to experts about the bill or regarding the bill. So the committee members are the ones who are probably the most knowledgeable about the bill. Make sense so far? Once a bill is debated on the House floor, it is then voted on. What does it take to pass a bill in the House of Representatives? Usually 218 votes. If everybody's present, 218 yes votes will pass the bill in the House of Representatives. Is it law yet? No, where does it go? It has to go to the other house. All legislation have to be passed by both houses. So it starts all over again. It goes to a committee in the Senate, and then if the Senate likes it, it goes to the Senate floor. If the committee doesn't like it, then it dies. Anyone have any questions? So it goes like that. So it's exactly. like a snake. So the process starts all over again. Exactly. It has to start all over again, and then in the Senate, they talk about the bill, and then at the end, they vote on it. In the Senate, the numbers are simpler. What does it take? How many yes votes did it take to pass this bill in the Senate? 51. There's 100 senators, so 51. Usually 51 votes. Right now, since the Senate is 50-50, usually, because there's 50 Republicans and 50 Democrats, and usually the vote goes split down the middle, whose vote counts more? The Vice President's tiebreaker counts more. Make sense so far? Once both houses pass the bill, then it goes to the President's desk, and then he can sign it and make it into law. Any questions? Guys, this is AP government. I hope it was that simple. It's not that simple. Let's talk about what actually happens. The bill is proposed. It has to be proposed by either senators or House of Representative members. In the House of Representatives, a bill doesn't automatically go to a committee that it's appropriate. It gets given to the Speaker of the House. The Speaker of the House is the leader of which House of Congress? The House of Representatives. Who's the Speaker of the House today? Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi. Yesterday I told you she is the most powerful person in Congress. Here's one of her powers. In the House of Representatives, all bills proposed goes to her desk. Her job is to assign this bill to the appropriate committees. So let's say this bill is about farming. She can assign it to the Agricultural Committee. Now here's the thing. That power, although insignificant to some of you, is actually very significant. The ability of the Speaker of the House to assign bills to committees is very powerful when it comes to affecting whether or not this bill will have a chance of passing. So if I was the Speaker of the House, a bill comes to my desk. My job is to assign it to a committee. I like this bill. So what do I do? How do I use my power to assign this bill to committees? To my advantage to make sure or to affect increase the likelihood of this bill passing. I can do two things. I can refer it to a committee that's predisposed to pass it. I know the people of that committee are going to um, let this bill go through the process. Or I can assign it to multiple committees. Because how many of them does it take to like the bill for it to move on? only takes one. So if I really like the bill, I give it to a committee that I know is going to let it through, that's going to give it a favorable recommendation, or I give it to multiple ones. Because it only takes one of those committees to give it a favorable recommendation for it to go through the process, for it to move on. Make sense? What happens if I don't like the bill? What happens? I do the opposite. I give it to a committee that's most likely going to what? It's going to reject it. It's going to kill it. Or, I only give it to how many committees? 
One. One. If that committee hates it, what happens to it? Dies. It dies. Make sense? Again, she's not, this, she doesn't decide whether or not a bill will pass or fail, but she can affect the chances of a bill passing or failing. Make sense so far? In the Senate, it's simpler. They just have like a clerk that assigns it to the appropriate committees. He doesn't play politics. He's not like the Speaker of the House. So it's simpler in the Senate. All good? In committee, what do they do? They do something called a markup. A markup means they're going to do a hearing on the bill. They're going to debate the bill. They're going to talk about it. The bill can be changed. What's another word for change? Okay. Amended in committee. They can change the bill to their liking if they wanted to. They bring in experts, usually people from lobbyists or from, from interest groups, to come in and talk about the bill, whether or not they're in favor of it or against it. They consider their options. They bring in experts. If it's about climate change, then they bring in meteorologists. If it's about agriculture, they bring in farmers or agricultural engineers. So they bring in experts, they debate the bill, they can amend the bill to their liking if they want to, and at the end, they vote. What does it take in committee in order for it to, be, to move on? A simple majority, we call that a favorable recommendation. Again, most bills though, 80% of bills proposed, this is where they end up dying. Most of them don't make it past committee. All right, now. In the House of Representatives, though, there is a special procedure that you all need to know about. It's always a favorite question on your AP exam. If a committee refuses to give a bill a favorable recommendation, in the House of Representatives, and only in the House, there is a way to resuscitate it back to life in order for it to move on in the process. And that way is called a discharge petition. What does it mean to discharge something? Get rid of it. Get rid of it, release, release. So let's say this is a committee. And this committee has assigned this bill. They talked about it. They don't like it. So they're probably going to vote no on it, and they're going to kill the bill, and it doesn't get to move on. The rest of the House of Representatives don't even get to see it because the committee will die. It will kill it early on. What we can do, if we're really interested in the bill, we can get a signature of 218 members of the House of Representatives. That's why it's called a what? Discharge what? Petition. If we get 218 signatures, which is a what for the House of Representatives? What number, what, that, what does that number represent? Simple majority. A simple majority, more than half of the House of Representatives. If we can get that number, then this committee, no matter what their opinion is about the bill, will be forced to release the bill to the House floor. So this committee is holding the bill hostage. They don't want to release it. They're probably going to kill it. We can call for a discharge petition, get 218 signatures, and this committee will be forced to release it to the House floor. Any questions about that? This only happens in which house? house of, in the Senate. If a committee doesn't like a bill, what happens to it? It will die. There's no way to resuscitate it back to life, like in the House of Representatives, where you can call for a discharge petition. Here's what you need to know. Discharge petition is very rare. Why is it rare? Why is it rare? Two reasons why it's rare. 218 signatures for a bill that we don't know anything about, that's very difficult to get. And number two, if we do a discharge petition, whose knowledge and expertise are we questioning? The people in the committee. The people in committee were put in that committee because of their expertise. If they want the bill to die, it's because they're knowledgeable, because they're, they're experts in that particular policy area, and they don't feel it's good enough to be introduced to the House floor. But what a discharge petition does is, you're saying, you know what, it is good enough. We don't care about your expertise, we don't care about your knowledge, we're going to force it through. We're going to ram it through. And in the House of Representatives, you need friends. If you're going to alienate an entire committee, maybe they're not going to vote on a bill that you want to pass later on. You're questioning the committee members' expertise. You're questioning your fellow congressmen's expertise. That's why this doesn't usually happen. Any questions? All right, let's move on. Now, before. After the committee gives it a favorable recommendation, or if we force it with a discharge petition, 
it does not go to the House floor right away. What did I tell you in the beginning of this unit? In the House of Representatives, because they have more members, they need more what? They need more rules. So once a committee is done with the bill, it doesn't go to the House floor right away. It goes to a very important committee called the House Rules Committee. The House Rules Committee has one job. They assign procedures and rules for debate. They assign rules and procedures for debate. So that when a bill gets to the House floor, we know the procedures for debate. We have rules in place for debate. What kind of rules? One, they schedule the bill for debate. They're the ones that decide when the House of Representatives is going to be debating the bill when the bill is going to be discussed on the House floor. So they schedule the bill for debate. Number two, they decide the time for debate. And number three, they decide what types of amendments can be made on the bill once it gets to the House floor. What types of changes would they allow to be made on the bill once it reaches the House floor? They can be flexible in the types of changes, or they can be very rigid and not allow a lot of changes to be made on the bill. All right, guys. This is bolded on your notes. And it's very important. Just like the Speaker of the House, the power of this committee should not be underestimated. Depending on the rules that they assign that bill, for, uh, the rules for debate that they assign, they can affect the likelihood of bills passing or not passing. For example, for the House Rules Committee, a bill comes in, the majority of us hates it. When do we schedule it? High priority or low priority? Low priority. So that it's more likely to what? To die. If we like it, if the majority of us like it, then we put it as high priority. Time. We like this bill. How much time do we give our fellow House of Representative members to discuss and debate the bill? A lot of time or very little time? We're going to give them a lot of time. We're going to give them time to digest it and research it so that they're more likely to vote what? Vote yes. Make sense? If we don't like it, how much time do we give it? Very little. We can even give it zero. What does that mean? When we're done with it and it gets to the House floor, what does the, what does the House need to do? have to vote on it. They can't even discuss it. They have to, and what is the likelihood of a congressman voting yes on a bill that they haven't discussed? No. Very little. So it's probably going to die. So we can give it zero time if we wanted to. We can give it as little time as, as we want or a lot of time as we want. Make sense so far? When it gets to the House floor, we can also assign amendments. Over. We can also decide what kind of changes can be made on the bill. If we like the bill, do we allow changes? Or are we going to be very strict? Mm. We're going to allow changes. We're going to be very flexible. Why? So let's say Corbin over here is a, a, a member of the House of Representatives. A bill is being discussed, right? But he doesn't like parts of it, some parts of it. If we allow changes, then we can change it to Corbin's liking, so he's going to say yes to it. But if we don't allow changes, what's Corbyn going to do? Say no. George is going to, Corbyn's going to say no. Minor changes that can affect his likelihood of voting on the bill, which we could have done if we allowed changes, could have made this bill pass. So if we like it, we allow a lot of changes. If we don't like it, we're rigid. We're not going to allow amendments. Or we're going to allow very little amendments. So that when it gets to the House floor, it's take it or leave it. You like the bill, you vote yes. If you don't like the bill, you vote no. We can't change it for you. Does that make sense? So we, we want to be more flexible with the amendments. If we like it, we want to be more rigid with the amendments. If we don't like it, strict. Make sense so far? Anyone confused? All right, another thing that will confuse you. Another thing that the House of, or the House Rules Committee can do
one is really confusing, so I need you to pay attention. There you go. The House Rules Committee, usually, once they're done assigning rules for debate, they release the bill to the House of Representatives. The 434, all 435 members debate the bill and to vote on the bill. But there are times and there are situations in which the House Rules Committee does not release the bill to the House floor, to the regular House floor, and instead they release it to what we call the Committee of the Whole. So what is the Committee of the Whole? The Committee of the Whole is just the House of Representatives with a different name. It's the same building, it's the same members. The only difference between the Committee of the Whole and the House of Representatives is, unlike in the House of Representatives, where debate is going to be bogged down by rules and procedures. In the, in the Committee of the Whole, there are not a lot of rules, there's not a lot of procedures. This is done to expedite the voting and the debate. This is done usually during times of emergencies. During times of emergencies, we can't wait for the House of Representatives to follow all the rules and procedures. The House Rules Committee instead of referring it to the regular House of Representatives, refers the bill to the Committee of the Whole, where there are not a lot of rules, fewer rules, fewer procedures, which means faster debate, faster voting, and more likely that a bill will pass. The best example I can give you of this is during 9-11, when we needed policy making and legislation right away, the House Rules Committee referred a lot of legislation to the Committee of the Whole, because we couldn't wait for a long time. So we needed a way to get rid of those rules and to get rid of those procedures. So instead of referring bills to the regular House of Representatives, the House Rules Committee referred them to the Committee of the Whole. Again, very rare, not usually done, usually done during times of emergencies to expedite the voting and the debate on the bill. Will referring it to the Committee of the Whole make it more likely or less likely to pass? more likely to pass because it's not going to be bogged down by a lot of procedures and rules. However, does it make sure that it passes? No. No, it doesn't. It just increases the likelihood of a bill passing. Any questions about the Committee of the Whole? We might have a quiz today. Some of you are glazed over for some reason. Make sure you're paying attention. Any questions? All right, next. After the House of Representatives is done with the bill, where does it go next? It goes to a Senate committee, or if the bill's from the Senate, it goes to the House committee. Before that, guys, let's talk about what happens on the House floor and the Senate floor. During debate on the bill, a couple of things happen. Again, just like a committee, they bring in experts sometimes. Um, they bring in testimonies from people who are knowledgeable about that particular policy area. They debate the bill. The congressmen take turns talking about it, whether or not they're for it and against it, trying to convince their fellow congressmen to um, vote yes or vote no. If you're the majority leader, the minority leader, and the whips, what are you trying to do during this time? What are you trying to do? You're pushing for it. You're trying to push your party members to vote according to your party's agenda, according to your party's goals. So if you're the Speaker of the House, the Majority Leader, the Minority Leader, and the Whips, you're trying to get votes. Whatever your party wants, whether or not to kill the bill or to pass the bill, you're trying to get people to vote that way, whether yes or no. They're busy getting support, getting their party members in line, and maybe getting people from the other party to support the bill or to reject the bill. Make sense so far? Anyone confused so far? All right, two things can happen during debate on the House floor and the Senate floor. There are deals being made in the back room that's not really about the bill. One procedure that's done a lot in the House of Representatives and the Senate is called log rolling. So what is log rolling? Log rolling is exchanging support for each other's legislation, exchanging support for each other's bills. So let's say, I'm the sponsor of this bill, I want it to pass. Nicholas over there is reluctant, he wants to vote no, I want his vote, I want this bill to pass. What can I offer Nicholas? That has nothing to do with the contents of this bill. What can I offer him? 
I can make a deal with Nicholas and say, hey, Nicholas, I know you want to vote no. But if you vote yes for this bill today, next time, what am I going to do for him? Yes, next time, I'm going to vote for bills that you like. You have my support next time. You have my vote next time. That's why it's called log rolling. Have you ever heard the phrase, keep the log rolling? So log rolling increases the chance of a bill passing. Because senators and House of Representative members are making deals in the back rooms behind, um, um, during the, the debate, trying to get an upvote, trying to put up the vote that they need to pass the bill or to reject the bill. So that's called log rolling, exchanging support for each other's bill. I'll vote for your bill today if you vote for my bill tomorrow. Any questions regarding that, guys? Next, another thing that can happen on the House floor is riders and pork barrels can be attached. By the way, all of these mean the same thing for the purposes of AP government. There's slight differences between them for the purposes of this class. When you see any of these three words, riders, pork barrels, earmarks, they mean the same thing for me, they mean the same thing for you. Here's another way I can get people to support my bill. I can attach federal spending to this bill. Spending that doesn't have to be related to what the bill is about. So let's say I need his vote. He's reluctant to go yes. Here's what I can do for him. A, I'm going to attach $5 million of federal funds into this bill for your home state. Maybe he's a senator. So I'm going to give your state $5 million for a bridge, a new university, to fix your highways. Well, maybe he's a House of Representative member, so I'll give it to his what? To his district, right? House of Representative members are constituents of the district. So I'll give it to your constituency. I'll give it to where you represent a, a state or your district. I'll give you money. I'll attach spending to this bill. Now, why is that going to make him more likely to say yes? Why is that going to make Ivan more likely to say yes? It's not going to go directly in his pockets. Because the people will like see that as the, the leader, like the representative Very is the good. one that's able to do that. Next election, Ivan can tell his constituents, hey, I got to that bridge. Mm -hmm. Because of me, that university was built. So what is, by saying yes to my bill, he's also going to be saying yes to the $5 million. Does that make sense? No one is confused by that. So this is often done. That's why legislation in Congress is so lengthy. A lot of it is not really about the bill. It's about earmarks and pork riders being attached to it to appease certain congressmen and to appease certain senators uh, that they want to support the bill. That's why is it called a rider? Because it's riding along the bill, right? Pork barrels. A long time ago when you buy a pig, they gave you the meat, the pork loin, the ribs, and stuff like that. And then they give you a barrel of innards, hearts, organs, right? It's something that is extra. That's why it's called pork barrel. Make sense? Anyone confused by this? All right. Here's the problems with earmarks and pork barrels, guys. Let's say he's a senator from California. Who's paying for that bridge that we're going to build in California? It's federal funding. Who pays for it? Everybody in the United States. You might live in Texas. You might live in Hawaii or Alaska. Are you ever going to benefit from that bridge? No, you're never going to benefit. You're paying for things right now. Your parents are paying for things right now that they're never going to benefit from. They're paying for a university in one state that their kids will never go to. Also, if he wants something for me, what are you going to want? You're going to want something for your state. You're going to want something for your district. What happens to federal spending? up. It goes way up. That's why the government spends a lot of money, and we owe a lot of money a day. Part of it's because of this. Again, writers and pork barrels, they allow to, to congressmen to credit claim. They can claim credit for those federal projects, for those federal programs that um, were funded. Any questions so far? So log rolling and earmarks, those can happen in both houses of Congress. All right, now we get to, so they can happen in the House and they can happen in the Senate. 
Again, in order to pass a bill in the House of Representatives, it needs a simple majority. So how many is that? 200. To 18. If you get to 18 yes votes, then it passes. Very simple. It passes. In the Senate, it takes how many? 51. 51. Except not really. There's a couple of procedures in the Senate that you need to know about um, that can expedite a bill, that can make it more likely to pass can make it less likely to pass. There's three that you need to know about for today. These, the what I'm about to talk about, are exclusive to the Senate. This does not happen in the House of Representatives. All right. First, unanimous consent agreement. Unanimous consent agreement is an agreement done in the Senate to waive a lot of the procedures and rules of debating. This is done to expedite the debate and voting process in the Senate. So if they want a bill to be discussed and voted on fast, they want to expedite the passage of a bill, then they can do a unanimous consent agreement where the Senate agrees, you know what, we're going to get rid of these rules, we're going to waive some of these procedures, so that we can immediately debate and vote on the bill without being bogged down by rules. This is very similar to what happens in the House of Representatives. When the House Rules Committee refers the bill to what? Committee of the, the Whole. Committee of the Whole. This is very similar. But here's the thing that you need to remember here. How many senators is required for this agreement to come to life? All of them. It has to be unanimous. You want to expedite the passage of a bill, you need all 100 senators to agree. Hey, let's get rid of some of these rules, let's get rid of some of these procedures, let's talk about it, let's vote on it. Let's try to be fast. Again, let's try to expedite this process. Is it, does it mean the bill's going to pass? No, it doesn't, but it makes it more likely to pass because it's not bogged down by a lot of the rules and procedures. Any questions about that, guys? So unanimous consent agreement, it requires all, all senators to waive the rules and procedures and to expedite the voting on a bill. These two are vicious. A lot of legislation right now are not being passed in Congress because of these two procedures. One procedure is a whole. One senator can refuse to move on to discuss the bill or to vote on the bill by putting a hold on the bill. One senator can put a hold on the bill. How do you do this? A senator can publicly say, I'm going to put a hold on the bill. We're going to stop. I need more information about the bill. I'm not ready to vote. I need more information. That's basically what a hold is for. If a senator feels like he's not going to be able to make the correct decision, He's not going to be able to make an educated decision, so he puts a hold on the bill because he needs more information about the bill. He's not ready to move on to a vote. He's not ready to move on to discussion. So this delays discussion and the voting on a bill. In practice, guys, this is not really about a senator wanting more information. In practice, why do senators put a hold on bills today? Because they don't like it. They don't want it to pass. They don't want it to move on in the process. So one senator can put a hold on the bill, and the whole thing will collapse. And you put a, or you, you hold the Senate hostage because of it. You can't move on. Now, you can do this publicly, or you can do this secretly. You can talk to your party leaders, the majority leader, if you're a Democrat today, or your minority leader in the Senate, if you're a Republican, and you can say, hey, I'm going to put a hold on that bill. Don't tell anyone it was me. So a bill can be held, and we don't know which one of us is doing the hold. Make sense so far? All right, next is the filibuster. I know some of you have seen what a filibuster is. In the Senate, there's really no time limit for debate. In the House of Representatives, is there a time limit? Who decides the time limit in the House of Representatives? House the House Rules Committee. In the Senate, debate can go on theoretically indefinitely. Now, in the Senate, we take turns debating. Uh, we take turns talking. So right now, I control the Senate floor. I'm the one talking. Maybe I'm for the bill, maybe against the bill. 
Brianna over here wants to be the one talking. She wants to express her opinions. So she's going to ask me, will the senator yield the floor? Yield means give up. Oftentimes, I say yes. She replaces me up here. But what I can do is, I can always say what? No. I can say no. I can hold the floor indefinitely as long as I want to. Why would I do that? Why would I want to prolong the debate? A filibuster is prolonging the debate. What am I trying to avoid by prolonging this debate? Prolonging. What am I trying to avoid, guys? Somebody said it. A vote. I'm trying to avoid a vote. If I know, as a senator, there's enough members of the Senate, how many senators does it need? 51. If I know there's 51 senators that are ready to vote yes, I can just hold the floor of the Senate indefinitely, prolonging the debate about the bill, and never get to a vote. There's a couple of rules on a filibuster. Number one, you need to keep on talking. If there is a long pause, that means you're going to be giving up the floor and somebody can replace you and they can move on to a vote. So you need to talk and talk and talk. No long pauses. You need to be standing up. No breaks. You can't go to the restroom. But other than that, no rules. You don't have to even be talking about the bill itself. You can be talking about anything else as long as you keep yourself talking and standing up. A lot of senators, when they do a filibuster, they bring in their Bibles and they start reading off the Bible. Phone books and cookbooks, reading off names. As long as you keep talking. As long as you keep control of the floor and not let it go to a vote. You want to avoid the vote. Today, even a threat of a filibuster scares senators and they just give up. If, somebody said, uh, if a senator said, you know what? I'm going to do a filibuster on that bill. Don't even bother. Most of the time, the Senate just gives up on the legislation. One senator can delay the passage of a bill by doing a filibuster. Any questions about that, guys? The longest filibuster on record is 24 hours long. And it was done not for a good reason. It was done to defeat the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was a racist senator trying to defeat a good legislation. But this is done today. All right, now. I have a question. Yes, what is uh, cloture? That's what we're about to talk about. Oh, okay. a very good question. Cloture is the only way that we can stop a hold, and we can stop a filibuster, we can call for a cloture. A cloture requires 60 senators, but it's the only procedure that can end a hold and that can end a filibuster. If we want that guy to shut up so that we can move on to a vote, a cloture can be called, but it requires 60 senators in order to do so. So that we can move on to a vote. 60 senators. Does that mean the bill is going to pass? Not really. It means that we just get to what? Vote. We just get to vote. But most likely it is going to pass. So a 60 senator cloture is required to defeat a filibuster and to defeat a hold. This is where I want you to pay most attention to. What is the implication of holds and filibusters to the likelihood of bills passing and not passing? Holds and closures are a detriment to lawmaking. They make it harder for bills to pass. One senator can hold the entire Senate hostage, can halt the lawmaking process by doing a hold or by doing a filibuster. That's why I told you last time that in the Senate, each individual senator are more powerful than an individual member of the House of Representatives. Because one senator, one out of 100, it doesn't matter if you're new to the Senate or you've been there for 30 years, you can do a filibuster, you can hold a bill, and you can delay voting, you can delay lawmaking by yourself. You have a lot of influence as one senator. There's another implication. It's harder to pass bills in the Senate. Does it actually take just 51 senators to pass a bill? It does not. Not today. Not in practice. In theory, yes, that's what the Constitution says. 51, simple majority of the Senate. But in practice, how many senators do you actually need? Even if, guys, think about it today. Even if we get 51 votes right now on this bill that I want to pass, 
if Brianna over here hates it, she's just gonna do a hold. She's just gonna perform a filibuster. And then where are we at? This pill will die. What do we actually need? How 60. much of us do we actually need? 60. We need a 60 senator cloture. Because we might not even get to a vote. We might have the necessary votes, but we might not even get there because she's holding or she's doing a filibuster. So in order to defeat those, we need 60 to call for a culture. It's actually a lot harder. It's not just a simple majority. It's a super majority that's needed to pass bills in the Senate. So today, how productive is the Senate? Look at the count. 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans, one vice president that can break ties. The Democrats technically have the majority, right? But do they have enough for cultures? No. A Republican senator can stand and do a filibuster. He can do a hold, and he can prevent democratic legislation, democratic agenda from passing through. And the Democrats can't do anything about it because they don't have the numbers to call for a culture. Make sense? All right, next is the conference committee. The conference committee, oh, by the way, over here. Once a bill passes both houses of Congress, it doesn't go to the president's desk right away. It goes to a conference committee. Conference committee is made up of members from both houses. It's a joint committee. It's made up of members from both houses. And they have one job. Here's their job. Guys, all throughout this process, what is probably happening to the bill that was originally proposed? It's changing. It's changing. It's being amended in committee. It's being amended on the House floor. And then when it gets over here in the Senate, it could be amended in the Senate committees. It could be amended on the Senate floor. Here's what you need to remember. The version of a bill that the House of Representatives passed and the version of the bill that the Senate voted on and passed are more likely going to be what? They're going to be different. They're probably not going to be the same. It's being amended. Writers are being attached to it. So the conference committee this is a question that a lot of kids always forget. Don't ever forget this. It's the conference committee has only one job. They took the two versions of the bill, they reconciled the differences, and they create one bill. So they take the Senate version and the House version of a bill that they passed, put them together, create one version of a bill, reconcile the differences between the two bills. And then where does it go? Not yet. One final time. This is what's frustrating about this whole thing. One final time. Is this bill that the conference committee created, the bill that the House of Representatives passed, and the bill that the Senate passed? So one last time, it has to go back to both houses of Congress, and they have to vote on it again. But usually, but when it gets to the conference committee, usually they're just going to pass it. There's really not a lot of talk. They're just going to pass it. And then it goes to the president's desk, where all that hard work we just talked about can be undone by the president with a what? With a veto. They go through both houses. They have to go through both houses, yes. All bills have to go through both houses. So all that, all that hard work we just talked about can be undone with a veto. Or the president can sign it and make it into a law. But checks and balances, guys. Vetoes, checks and balances. But there's another check on the president. His vetoes can be overridden. But there is a requirement. Two thirds of both houses is required. Two thirds of the House, two thirds of the Senate. Not very good at math, so I don't know what two thirds of 435 is, and two thirds of 100. Well, that's 67 senators, I guess. So it can be overridden. It doesn't matter what the president says. It doesn't matter if he vetoes the bill. If they get two-thirds vote from both houses, then the bill will pass anyway. If they will overcome a veto. What is the likelihood of overriding vetoes? What's the likelihood of getting two-thirds of Congress of both houses to support something? High or low? low? Very, very low. 
Usually when the president says no, it will die. The bill will die. To give you a statistic, 5% of all vetoes are overridden. That means 95% of vetoes succeed in killing the bill. This is very difficult to get. Yes, ma'am. Why if they just agreed on it in the first place? I'm sorry? Why if they like withdraw that and then they... But remember, in the House of Representatives, to pass it, all you need is a simple majority, right? You just need more than 50%. In the Senate, it's the same thing. You just need more than 50%, right? But to override it, it requires two-thirds. That's a lot more than 50%. Does that make sense? All right. The president himself can participate in law rolling. He can also make deals with Congress, especially with the leaders of Congress. How? If I was President Biden, how can I make deals with Congress? Hey, Congress. This bill you like? This legislation you like? You want me to sign? I'll sign it. What do you do for me? Votes. Next time I want a bill pass, you better pass it. That make sense? He can use his veto and his signing power as leverage with Congress. He can tell Congress, hey, I have this agenda. I want this legislation passed. So to do that, I'll do you a solid. I won't veto this bill. I sign, I'll sign it into law. This bill that you want me to sign, I'll sign it. But next time, when I want something, I better get it. You better pass it. Make sense? You confusing? Uh, yeah, he can persuade with his um, veto. He can use it as leverage. Over here is party leader. The president of the United States is technically the leader of his party. So Donald Trump, when he was president, he was the leader of the Republican Party, and Joe Biden is the leader of the Democratic Party. What does that mean? He has a lot of influence over Democratic members of Congress which means he can put pressure on Democrats that are in the Senate and in the House of Representatives to vote on bills that he likes and to vote no on bills that he doesn't like. He is their leader after all. So he can put pressure on party members to meet his agenda. His, he also has his own agenda. He also has his own legislative goals. Right now, Joe Biden is trying to pass the infrastructure bill. That's his agenda. He's trying to get votes from both houses. Trying to get over filibusters. Trying to get over holds. All right. Now, this whole process, guys, is it easier or harder when we have a divided government? It's a lot harder. When the president and Congress is controlled by different parties, it's usually a lot harder. They have different goals in mind. They have different laws that they want to pass. So it's usually a lot harder. All right, guys, we'll continue this next time. Guys, if you haven't submitted this green sheet right here, make sure you do so. If you are thinking about dropping, make sure you talk to Mr. Macias. September 30th is the last day that you can do so, but you need to talk to him way before that. So today's tutoring, guys, I'll be here right after school, but you can be here at 420, 425. Again, if you got an A, just get your five points. Come here, help out people in reviewing. And I'll give you five points on a test.